Good evening. Welcome to the Areopagus Lecture for Fall 2005. I'm Randy Gabriels, Director of Areopagus. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing an old friend of mine. we we'll go back about 20 years. John and I were classmates at Calvin College, uh, where he earned his uh, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And also, we were teammates in cross country and track, where John won the national championship in the 3,000 meter steeplechase. John went on to do a master's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan and a doctorate at the University of Wisconsin, where he worked on hybrid engine lines and regenerative braking. He went on to continue that work um, in control systems and algorithms while teaching at the Milwaukee School of Engineering. And last year moved to Purdue University where he is studying and working on camless en engines and their flexibility in using multiple renewable fuels. Just this past summer, John finished building a house that he designed to energy efficient principles. And tonight he's here to speak about the question that he has been working on, on and off for about 15 years. Is sustainable transportation achievable? A resource stewardship view. Please welcome John Lumkus. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, can everyone hear me fine? Okay, if you can, I, I tend to start wandering. I'm not used to being quite uh, tied down, but in order to use the mic and uh, my notes to get everything right. Um, Randy did a good job. He didn't tell you he forgot his uh, introduction that he spent all afternoon writing up for me, but he did a good job. So, um, Okay, it's a uh, hot topic. I'm not sure 15 years is long enough even to comprehend the beginning of it, but um, what I want to do is uh, go through some tonight, get you... Some might be review, but hopefully start you thinking about some things too, and also the, some of the misconceptions maybe that people have in uh, the way media portrays what's happening in transportation right now. It's an interesting time. Uh, not as many people are saying that oil prices are going to go back to the levels they used to be anymore. Okay, other than the fact that we pay high prices for gas, I'm not all that upset about that. Um, so let's, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. What I want to go through tonight is kind of where have we been. It's going to kind of be a snapshot of relationship between energy population and transportation. Okay, why is transportation an important one? I think that will become very clear when we look at total energy use. Um, where are we at current policies and technologies? Most of you or some of you might be aware there was a new Energy Policy Act uh, just passed uh, by Congress a couple months ago. And then where are we going? Um, you hear the buzzwords fuel cell, oxygen, e oxygen economy. Okay, Bush made a lot of people excited when he mentioned, I forget the time frame he gave in years, but he you know, gave us a strong statement, we will be an you know, ox oxygen economy and ex I'm, I'm way off. Hydrogen? Okay. I don't know anything I'm talking about here. <laughs> Discounts. Okay. You know, it didn't sound right. My mind wasn't registering it, and I should, you know. Yeah, I was thinking about, we use the oxygen from the air, and I was going to remember to say that when I talk about fuel cells, that we produce the, we bring the hydrogen, it takes the oxygen from the air. So, when I get to that slide, you no longer need to listen. Now I spilled the beans. I was thinking ahead and talking words from ahead. Okay, sorry about that. And then where are we going? And um, then I'm going to ask the question, not so much where are we going, because I think that media has made pretty clear, but maybe where should we be going and what's the challenge facing us? Um, some of these areas I've studied more uh, from a standpoint of interest and how it relates to my specialty area. Some of it I have been more involved with, so the, the, some of the depth of the examples will change a little bit. Um, Fill in my background a little bit. My initial um, exposure was I wanted to do control systems work. Madison had a project on hybrid vehicles in uh, 1990, and I got started on optimizing the control strategies for hybrid vehicles back in 1990. There already had been hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles before that, but of course fuel prices went down. If fuel prices go down, how many people want to buy a hybrid vehicle? Okay, so my view is there's the technology has been out there. What we're using right now, the technology has been out there for a while. Now, not the electronics, and that, that's an important part. The concept behind a hydrogen vehicle is actually quite simple. 
the implementation and getting it all to work right. How many people have seen either a presentation or some of the slides by Richard Smalley, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry? No. Okay. Well, I guess that's good. He um, did a study. Uh, being a Nobel Prize winner, you get to travel a lot and speak to a lot of important people. And he polled every audience he went to, and he came up with a humanity's top ten problems for the next 50 years. Okay. I won't make you guess what the number one is because you, well, you should if you've read the title or, or gather what we're talking about. Number 10 was population. Can we go through these and not make you guys guess? It's not a quiz night. Um, so after he surveyed these audiences, um, they said population. Right now we're at about 6. Point, well, we were at 6.3, 2050, 8 to 10. Um, democracy, we'll go through some of these quicker because I just want to get to the main point here. Poverty, environment, okay, food, water. What's the top one? energy okay and again I'm not going to even really talk about it too much but it provides a very good scope for what we're talking about and I'm going to talk about the transportation sector and I think you'll also see that that's a very important part of the energy picture certainly in the US and more so now in other countries but he posed the question and I won't deal with it tonight but just ask yourself if we solve the energy problem okay and we'll do hypothetically if we had unlimited amounts of energy could we solve a lot of those other problems on the list could we solve the water problem? Could we solve the food problem? Well, hopefully we could solve those. Environment, okay, you have to make the assumption it's a clean source of energy. That's the difficulty we're at nowadays. And he, he would go further and say, well, poverty and terrorism, if you had cheap electricity to every nation, okay, there would be, the poverty rate would be reduced. And terrorism, war, we fight over things that are usually related to that, um, disease, education, so forth. So in the global sense, we're going to focus down in a minute on transportation. Um, Keep in mind kind of that. So I have a couple. I'm going to kind of give you a snapshot of where we're at right now. Good news is from 1850 to 1970, our population tripled. The, um, the energy went up 12-fold. So three times the number of people, 12 times the number of energy that we use. Okay, not very good. But since 1970, population went up 68%. Energy use only went up 73 Okay. Um, so at least we're not you know, using more energy per person, or at least not significantly. Now, what's the bad news part of that? It's tied, still tied to the population, and energy use continues to rise. So we're, we're in a world that the energy use is uh, constantly increasing. You can't really say exponentially if you look at trends, but it's certainly going up. And in particular, the production of food, only 10 to 20 percent of the input energy is in the production of the food. 80 to 90 percent is in the transportation, processing, and consumption. Okay, so it's a significant problem, not even just in the production of food. That's a small percentage of the energy that it takes. Again, transportation comes up. And then a scary uh, stat in where we're at. In 1992, China and India averaged 0.7 barrels of oil per person per year. Okay, it's hard to get new numbers always out of these countries. But for comparison, in 92, the U.S. averaged 22.5 barrels of oil per person per year. Okay. Do you think that China and India are going to stay at that level or that they have already? No. Okay. So it's not a stretch, and I don't think I have to convince anyone tonight that the picture doesn't get better when we look 50 years out. In fact, the trends are not um, pointing in that favor at all. Um, the uh, other plot, I just kind of threw it on there as an afterthought because it's a nice time scale. It's 1650 to present, and it's the amount of total energy used by the world. Okay. Yeah, so we've managed to use a significant portion of our energy resources in a relatively short period of history of time. 1650, you could go back to, you know, uh, 2000, uh, you can go back to zero, whatever you want to do, and then, you know, it does make one big blip. If you look at it in terms of history, we used one big spike of energy, okay? Um, the trends aren't changing in the sense of what we're doing. If, in fact, if you look at petroleum right here, okay, the trend, this is up to 2004, is pretty steep, okay? So... Again, kind of give you an oil picture of where we're at. Um, where do we get our world energy from right now? Okay, oil and coal, okay, gas. And again, this is a projection, okay, and uh, for anyone that's looked into oil stuff or coal supplies, whatever you want to look into, if you want to find sources that say that we have a lot of oil reserves, you probably can. If you want to find people that say we're going to run out in five years, you can find those too. So it's really hard to, in other words, there's a lot of guesswork on what we actually have. We know we have oil down there. A lot of it's in shale, uh, sand. I mean, it, it, we know that the more oil we take out, the harder the remaining oil is going to get. Okay. So it's not going to go away. Now, coal is an interesting one that will come up later, and certainly for Indiana, 
in Illinois. I'm not sure in uh, Iowa's coal reserves, but we have relatively large coal reserves left in the U.S. Um, okay, so let me uh, keep my notes here. Okay, now let's turn to petroleum because that's ultimately what we're going to look at more with the uh, auto industry now. In the United States, million of barrels per day relative to the other countries. Again, look at China here. Look at the trend. This is up to 2004. Okay, they're probably not going to even follow the same trend as the U.S. They're probably going to come closer to catching us up, assuming that oil supply stays steady. Obviously, the USSR had some things change since that time. Japan's leveled off. Population has leveled off there, too. Okay, But the, the, the trend is there. There's some hiccups, but um, not a big selling point. Okay, how many people have heard, it, it's gone by different names since then, but the, the Hubbard Peak, okay, we've got some oil people out there. Um, he predicted it, what was it, 15 years in advance for the U.S. oil peak, okay. Um, he, uh, his technology or theories, I guess, would predict that we're very close to hitting a world oil peak. Whether or not you want to believe that's up to you. Um, some of the stats, though. Uh, 33 of the 48 largest oil producing countries have already peaked. Okay. Um, the U.S. currently uses 18 million gallons of oil a day. There's more reserves, but in, like I said, each case, um, harder to get. So um, other people have followed this on. I think the main question that we're finally getting to isn't so much that um, how much oil do we have left, but it's a matter of when will we run out um, with. In other words, we're, we're recognizing that there's a finite supply of that. Okay. Um, and uh, why transportation then? Okay, before we get into some of the technology. If you look at energy use by sector, okay, now the uh, green color, I'm not sure what the kind word is to call it, but anyways, that color is uh, it projected in 2025. And again, be careful with projections because they vary so much. But if you look at current use right now, transportation is the largest energy use in the United States. Okay, so if you want to try to find savings, okay, a lot of room uh, in there. Residential, commercial, okay, industrial's uh, big, but um, they're, they're much smaller. And I, I wouldn't say to discount them, but in terms of where we're we using a lot. Okay, in terms of petroleum-based energy, then transportation's way above industrial. Okay, it's above industrial in terms of total energy. It's even farther above if we start looking at petroleum-based. Um, what is the trend? You know, it's not slowing down. Okay, obviously something's got to give here. Um, the world oil consumption just last year increased 3.4%, the largest increase in 16 years. Okay, now my guess is this year we aren't going to see that increase. We'll probably see a decrease for obvious reasons. Um, but, uh, okay, getting the snapshot view here. Okay, global warming, you all hear about that. What's the contribution? Okay, total emissions, carbon dioxide is a large percentage of the total emissions of what we call greenhouse uh, gases. Break it down by sector, transportation, just in the past 10 years, passed up industrial as the largest okay, producer of CO2, which is kind of interesting because what are emissions levels on cars doing? They've continually gotten better. Okay, but what's the, the deciding factor in there? How many cars are we producing and how many are we driving? How many miles are we driving? Everything else has increased. Okay, so... If you look at the transportation industry, and again, all I'm trying to really do at this point is convince you that if we can start working on that, um, and then you have to talk about fuel cells and all that, it's an important part of the total energy picture. And in fact, in terms of petroleum, it's the one we're most reliable on. Okay. Um, if you look at the mean carbon dioxide levels, that's this little chart down here, just from 1965 to 19 or to 2004. Okay, the average has continually gone up in terms of uh, measured levels of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so, um, okay, where are we at right now? Let's take a snapshot, okay, of where we're currently at. Okay, by fuel rate, they mean miles per gallon. Okay, miles per gallon, we went up, we hit a plateau, we're there. Okay, I think it can go up a lot higher, but we certainly haven't yet. Okay, these are miles driven. Okay, sometimes the words on these are kind of confusing. And this is the, uh, let me make sure I get this right, gallons per, I don't know if it's vehicle or person, gallons per vehicle, okay. Um, okay, so we have leveled off. Okay, why haven't we gone up? Are cars more efficient nowadays than they were 10 years ago? Okay, there, in terms of efficiency, 
We've got variable valve actuation. We've got a lot of new uh, uh, stuff going on there. They're more efficient. They've gotten bigger. They've gotten more powerful. Those are the ones we're buying. Our energy use hasn't changed. Okay. So, um, make sure I got everything. Yeah. Um, fuel consumption per vehicle actually in normalized fell 21% from 73 to 91. So we use a lot less fuel per vehicle, a lot more on the road, a lot more powerful. Okay, where are we going? Okay, that's where I want to spend most of the tonight. Is our current path going to result in sustainable transportation? So I'm going to look at what are our current trends, hybrid vehicles obviously being the hot one in long-term fuel cells. Are they going to result in sustainable transportation? Are we actually able to achieve sustainable transportation? Okay, and obviously the, the easy answer to give is do we have a choice or the question to ask. Okay? Um, our society isn't one that wants to go back to horses, I don't think. Okay, we'll find some, some way to do this. Okay? And from my standpoint, it's a wonderful time to be an engineer or someone related in that because you've got an exciting career ahead of you, um, depending how you define exciting. But, okay. This is one of those slides that you're not supposed to ever put up because it's so busy because everyone just stands there and reads it then. So go ahead and read it. Okay, you got it all? Okay. <laughs> this uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005 is 1,746 pages long. Not sure it'll make a difference. Okay, I've tried to read through parts of it, and these are the numbers I've gathered on summaries. You know, you try to look for the executive summaries, the conclusions at that point because the document's so long. So I'm not sure the uh, lawmakers had time to read it either. If they do, I give them a lot of credit. Um, but some of the key numbers in here, okay, must use seven for seven and a half percent of electricity by renewables. Okay, that's not that far down the dis in the distance. Four billion gallons of biofuel, uh, ten percent from uh, solar, wind, biomass, other renewable. Okay, the next one is kind of funny. I'll just mention I, this one I put in there because it was more humorous. Requires federal alternative fuel fleets to use alternative fuels. Okay, they were required to purchase the alternative fuel fleets a while back. But supposedly they weren't required to actually use the re those fuels in there, so they all just been running standard gas and everything in there. <laughs> so now that you know, we, but we fixed the problem. Now we got a law that actually says you know use the alternative fuels in the alternative fleet vehicles. So we're making progress. Um, requires reduction by one million barrels of oil of oil per day over the next ten years. Well, how much do you think will increase by use if things don't change over the next ten years? Okay, so that you know is a questionable thing. And then there's a lot of, I just summarized, tax credit for homeowners. They are starting to get into energy efficiency, heat pumps. Um, kind of upset because when we built our house, we did all this stuff, and we didn't get many tax credits, but that's what life. What does the last slide mean? Oh, um, for standard hybrid vehicles and alternative fuel vehicles, there's up to, so there's, you know, scale typical tax credit, 3400 for hybrid, 4000 for alternative fuels. That would be like E85 vehicles. The, the bottom one, they have sp separate categories, so up to 12000 for heavy hybrid, so buses, okay, fleet vehicles, um, and then 32000 for heavy, you know, meaning commercial, whether it's bus or, or whatever, um, alternative fuel vehicles. So they can get up to $32,000 credit. The reason I'm asking deals with the tax credit given to people that buy Hummers. <laughs> I, I won't, yeah. On, would you comment on that, please? I, I've only read probably the same things you have. I think it's. Uh, but that, that's not the last line. No, oh no, no. This is, it would have to be a hybrid vehicle, heavy hybrid. So right now, where are the heavy hybrids? They're in buses, okay? Um, and, or if you took a city bus and you ran it off of an alternative fuel, um, then you would get that credit. No, not, no not, not by large vehicles. I would probably should rephrase that and say commercial vehicles. Yeah. Um, that being said, there's a lot of critics, okay, if nothing else, it draws attention that the that energy is an issue. Okay, I really don't think it'll probably solve a whole lot, but at least it does draw attention to what we're doing. Um, yeah, what, uh, just make sure I have down here, yeah. The, by the way, the total average I had up there in, in uh, how much we use, um, in uh, total energy we use just over 20 million barrels per day equivalent, nine of that um, goes to gas in terms of uh, talking about petroleum. Um, so 44% of our petroleum goes into gas, 20% um, into fuel oil, 8% into jet fuel, and uh, let me say, we can't remember my notes, only 4% in residential. So even in that case, um, a lot of these target the um, uh, vehicles, but it is the largest source of our petroleum use in that category too. Now the interesting one is aerospace, which is 8%. And we don't have time to get on there, but talk about solving an energy problem where energy density 
and a power density are much more critical. How are you going to fly with electric motors and current batteries? We're not even close to that. So, and that they actually emit their greenhouse gases where forty thousand feet. So it's an interesting. You know, we're a long ways from that. Um, that's an interesting problem in and of itself. Um, okay, so let me go into where we're at. Recent trends. Obviously, you'd be blind if you didn't see a resurgence of hybrid vehicles or hear about it. Okay, anyone in here own a hybrid? We got one. Okay, do you like it? Yeah. Okay. I was actually asked that by the students, and I almost felt bad because I'd given this talk and said, well, do you own a hybrid? I said, no, and I felt bad. I said, well, I never have owned a vehicle, I don't think, with less than 100,000 miles, and uh, <laughs> there's not any hybrids out there yet on that, so I'm not a big car person for spending my finances there. Um, emphasis on fuel cells. I'm going to talk about those. Clean diesel technologies, new engine technologies, and increased emphasis on biofuels, of which you know Iowa State is, is a big player in that. So, um, But I want to kind of tie that all in then is where are the available energy sources going to come from? Hybrid vehicles, okay, if this is a review, I'm sorry if it's new to you, at least you kind of understand why everyone's talking about them. The, the main advantage, assuming energy storage, which if they have batteries they do, is regenerative braking and engine road load decoupling. In other words, our engine is optimized at some operating point, probably not the operating point that you tend to, op to, to drive it. We, we, we normally have to make compromises when we set up fuel maps and we try to get it on the freeway. Everyone drives faster than they're supposed to on the freeway anyway, so that's no longer true if it's optimized there, but that's what we try to do. A lot of compromises. Well, if you can always run the engine at its optimized load point because you have some other buffer in your system, now you can run it at its optimal point. And then regenerative braking is basically every time I brake, it goes to heat, so we're going to try to store it. Um, now, I put in the comment, aggressive driving is rewarded, but there's a qualification on that. That's the assumption that I can store the energy. So we're going to look at some means of storing energy and um, things with high power densities like electrohydraulics, ultracapacitors, and then high energy densities, and I'll describe this a little bit more as we go batteries or, or basically chemical and flywheels. Okay, and they make a big difference in what application we might want to use them for hybrid vehicles. Promises, I've seen numbers from 20%, which is realistic, to 200%, which I'm not sure where they got that from. Um, there are improvements, but probably not 200%. Okay, it does lead to reduced emissions, burn less fuel. And it's interesting now because some of the new hybrids aren't so much that the overall miles per gallon is a whole lot better, but the car is pretty fast when you kick in the electric motor and the gas engine at the same time. So we're using it for performance now, too. Um, <laughs> it's America, you know, that's what we do. Um, okay, what's scheduled for production? This does not include the Prius, the Insight, the um, uh, Civic, Ford Escape. Those aren't on here. So you can see that there's a lot of activity by auto manufacturers to come out with hybrids. Um, the, uh, um, I think it's actually coming up, but Toyota, the uh, uh, chairman of their R&D, basically wants to have a million Toyota hybrids on the road by 2010. Okay, it's still not a total significant thing, but it is going up. And you notice now that a lot of trucks, okay, some of the larger vehicles are starting to get into hybrids too. Okay, we'll show you some examples of where those are being used. Okay, if you haven't seen this before, the top one, okay, not going to go through a lot. That's a conventional one. The engine goes through, transmission drives the wheels. The, bottom, the second one is what we call series. Sometimes you'll hear series hybrid versus uh, uh, parallel hybrid vehicles. Series, basically everything, if in this case it's a, a one example, they're converting it to electric, but everything has to run through an electrical path somewhere. Okay, there's not a mechanical linkage between the engine and the wheel. Now, this battery generator motor could also be hydraulics, okay, or some sort of mechanical thing with the flywheel. Okay, electrical is the most common and probably going to be the one that 90% that of the, the public sees. Um, and then you have hybrid electric parallel powertrain example, where now I can take basically power electrically or um, combustion engine power and basically split them or do whichever, you know, I can run on one or the other and in through the transmission. Okay, so there's advantages and weaknesses to both. Okay, I'll give you a quick overview on what the um, Honda and Toyota, how they've approached that. Um, the also term that you use are mild hybrids, electric motor assist, basically that's the Honda, the early Honda Civic and the Honda Insight. Okay. Full hybrids, capable of electric only for short periods of time, are the Honda Prius, or the Honda Prius, the new Honda Civic and the Toyota Prius are what we would classify as full hybrids. Okay, and again, I'll show you the difference a little bit. When we talk about motor assist, basically the motor stores some energy during braking and it gives some energy back into the acceleration, but it's an assist mode. Um, integrated, this stands for flywheel, motor, starter. Okay, what we're probably going to see at a minimum in, in almost all vehicles is taking the flywheel off and the starter off 
and putting in our alternator that can also run basically as a motor and act as our flywheel. So that would be a real cheap way to do a mild assist um, hybrid vehicle. You can't start the engine without, or start moving the car without running the engine, but you get a lot of the benefits without a lot of cost. Okay, manufacturers are going basically into that. That's what Chevy's, um, I think it's Chevy's new pickup truck has that kind of system. If you look at the bell housing, basically where they put that in there. Um, full hybrids. Okay, now I can basically not even run through this coupler or run strictly electrical. Okay, the Prius basically runs up to about 25 miles an hour before the engine turns on and then it goes into a dual mode. Um, and then you got this term called plug-in hybrids, which at, um, has anyone heard the term before? It's been in the news a little bit. Okay, it's primarily engineers with a lot of free time that are modifying their brand new Toyota cars. Okay, I'm guessing it's an engineer because they're the only people that would take a brand new product and cut it apart and try to make it better. <laughs> Think of it, yeah. Um, and what they're basically doing is putting extra battery packs on and trying to get, you know, if they have a 20 mile commute to work or 15 mile, they'll drive to work, never run the engine, plug it in, and drive back home. But I can still go on the trips and uh, run it as a normal hybrid. Okay, so we call it plug in hybrid. It's still a hybrid. Um, the interesting thing is Toyota, Honda, no one else has really announced any intentions to uh, come out with a plug in hybrid. Okay, and, and Part of the uh, guesswork going on by uh, some of the people that I work with in the auto industry is they spent a lot of money telling people that you finally don't have to plug in your car and it drives like a regular car. Okay, and all of a sudden they're going to say, "Well, here's a car now you can plug back in again." So they don't want to confuse the consumer. I'm not sure, but there, you know, there's an interesting politics side to that. So, okay, um, let's look at the uh, Toyota has the Synergy Drive, the Honda the Integrated Motor Assist. This just shows you some of the insides of it. But what's really interesting, it's hard to see on this background on here, but I'll circle around. They have a uh, basically a planetary gear set in here that the, the engine runs through a generator. The motor is attached to one of the other inputs and the wheels. The motor actually is tied to the wheels. Um, but the uh, generator and the engine are basically two other inputs. So by varying the generator speed, they can basically run it as a CVT. It's kind of a unique, uh, what we call power split device. Um, very interesting device to watch work because sometimes they actually route power all the way through here and it comes back and goes that way, which normal conventional theory says the more conversions you do, the worse it is, but the overall system efficiency is actually better doing that. So, you know, again, part of the you know, electronic controls and what we can do nowadays. Um, total blank. I have no idea what I was going to say. Oh, okay. Look at my notes. Helps. Get back on track. No. Okay. Um, a couple interesting points. Toyota Synergy Drive. Um, the actual the engine uses an Atkinson cycle. Okay, if there's combustion people in here, if not, basically it leaves the intake valve open longer, so it pulls in the intake air and it actually starts pushing some of it out back into the intake manifold to be used by the other ones. It's like, why in the world would you do that? Well, now what can I leave my throttle opening at? Okay, and basically leave that fuller, okay, more wide open, which means if you're not an engineer, that's not a constriction in coming into the engine, less pumping losses. And then they switch back to conventional. Okay, because you have variable valve actuation, these are some of the things you can do. So they combine a lot of technology. It's a pretty um, innovative little car. Um, and then the other uh, interesting thing is how many people have seen the Ford Escape or perhaps you heard about it? Okay, there, you, you hear a lot of things. Um, the way Toyota phrases it, Ford licensed the techno technology from Toyota to build the Ford Escape, okay, which is technically true. You hear Ford's take is they developed the same technology at the same time, but about a year later, and Ford license, or Toyota licensed the patented the technology sooner than Ford did. So instead of battling all the patents, Ford wrote, basically worked out a deal and said, "We'll give you some of our diesel technology. You give us your, uh, you know, license, license your uh, hybrid technology to us." So um, it's probably somewhere in the middle of those two things. But it really gave Ford a hit in uh, PR because they worked out this agreement and then Toyota, Toyota puts these plus re press reports out that uh, the Ford Escape is uh, Toyota licensed technology. So interesting little side bit on where the, the cars are at on there. Okay, current other current activity which you probably don't know about. Um, this is actually my first hybrid vehicle and, and uh, be embarrassed to show you pictures of me driving around the lab but we had a full working chassis of a hydraulic hybrid. Exact same theories works the same way but now instead of batteries we use hydraulics okay which is a strange thing I know to people that aren't familiar with hydraulics but in a couple slides I'll kind of fill in that picture um, the EPA initially started that program um, sponsored all my early research and have continued on they work with Fort Eaton Army they actually have a full-size vehicle running around um, done a lot of work in uh, pumps and motors they have a pretty big booklet out if you want to read what they've done 
put a nice uh, high efficiency diesel on there and they're getting decent um, hybrid hydraulic or hydraulic hybrid um, vehicles. Um, kind of interesting, uh, Eaton came out with a similar one. These are companies you may or may not be familiar with, but basically they put a pump motor, okay, basically in line with the drivetrain, so when you stop, it pumps energy into one accumulator, and when you accelerate, it takes it back out. Same idea as a battery, okay. They got a 30% improvement in economy, 15 to 20% performance, etc. Composite accumulators to save weight. Um, again, not a technology you normally think of, but there's certain applications where that's really attractive. Okay, and that comes down to this chart right here. What, what we talk about, and I used the two terms and I didn't define them, but we talk about specific energy versus specific power. Specific energy is how many miles can I drive before I have to either plug in again or do something. So if I have high specific energies, I can feasibly maybe get a car that I can drive 60 miles on before I have to recharge or whatever I have to do. Okay, if, but if it has a low specific power, the ability to put the, the power in and out, or basically the rate at which you can charge it, rate of change for the power, is very limited. And that's basically your typical battery. If I try to charge a battery quickly and discharge it, you generate a lot of heat and your efficiency goes way down and your battery life goes way down as well. Um, now the new batteries are obviously getting better, um, but what that means is go back to the earlier slide we talked about regenerative braking. Even a car like the uh, Toyota Prius, if you do a panic stop, very small percentage of that actually gets stored. Now if you do a normal, you know, stop the way you're taught to stop and you used to do when you had the person sitting next to you doing your driving test, then you get a lot more of it back, okay? Most of us don't drive that way, okay? I know the bus drivers normally don't. I know on Purdue's campus, I hear two settings, with throttle wide open, screeching brakes, okay? I don't think they know what the word coast means, okay? Now battery in that case would be a difficult application for that because what is the average rate of power in and out of the storage device? Very, very high. So in that case, you might want to look at something like accumulators where I can basically put the energy in and out of the accumulator in a matter of a second or two seconds during a stop and get all of it back out, even though the total amount of energy is relatively small. Okay, and that's what the military and some uh, places are looking at. Um, flywheels are a surprising one. They're actually very high energy densities in these new um, composite flywheels they have coming out, spinning at 13,000 RPM. They try to integrate the electronics around there for the motor because always you've got driveline problems. Um, but they can get energy densities uh, comparable with most batteries. Okay, now you got problems in a car because, you know, <laughs> you don't know if you want a gyroscope in your car or not. But um, so some interesting things. But flywheels were looked at way back in the 60s already, actually, in the U.S. Okay, um, so yeah, some interesting things. But that's where we're kind of at with hybrids and electric. You know, if you drew, you know, we, we had a fun thing since I was in uh, hydraulics at Madison. We used to say, you know, there's a certain amount of dollars going into hybrids. And then off over here was the hydraulic. Okay, that was the you know the crack in the seams, and uh, that's not completely true, but that's essentially what happened. So electric and the electric does have a lot of advantages. I'm not. I think there's applications for both, but I'm not a, a diehard one or the other. Um, I think from a normal consumer car, and the volume is all going to be in the electric. We've done a lot with power electronics and stuff over the years, where we can make that feasible. So, okay. Um, so that's hybrids. What about new engine technologies? Where are we at? Uh, clean diesel, uh, homogeneous charge, compression. Okay, these are things that may just go right over your head. Don't worry. Okay, it's not all that important. We'll conclude it at the end and give you the cliff notes. Um, In-cylinder treatments. Most companies are trying to do things with in-cylinder treatments because it costs a lot of money to do it if you have to do it outside of the cylinder. In other words, if I can solve the emission problems in the cylinder and not have to add a lot of post-combustion catalyst particulate traps in terms of diesels, I can keep my cost down. They got a lot of development front up cost, uh, development cost up front, but it keeps it down. And things like uh, EGR uh, simulation of combust, we're doing a lot more simulation stuff, multiple injections of fuel, uh, using pesos for that to get the speeds up. And there's a lot of new regulations going in. Um, in the off road, they're called tier one, tier two, tier three. We're going down, but um, just just for some background on here, tier three. To tier four, we just hit tier three, and to get into tier four represents another 90% reduction in emissions. If you actually plot out emissions of diesels, what's allowed over the last 20 years, you can hardly separate the next. The next emission tier four literally looks like it's on the line of zero. Okay, I mean that in terms of scale, that's all what the uh, manufacturers are being asked to do right now. Okay, funny thing is they complained a lot of times, but they're finding ways to do it now. Okay, now in Caterpillar's case, it cost them 500 million dollars of investment to do it. Okay, but we're doing it. Okay. 
Um, my guess is if you took the 500 million and looked at how often or how what the payback is with the fuel saved and the environmental concerns, it probably isn't all that long of a turnaround, to be quite honest. Um, uh, they have 250 patents that came out of as a result of this engine research. Um, Cummins has theirs out. Um, Today there's uh, just some stats, 1 million diesel-powered off-road machines. It's a significant number. Um, airports, all their, their ground support stuff, uh, construction, mining, diesel, farming. Okay, So the off-road stuff is actually something that the EPA has ignored for quite a few years that also in the, the, their stringent, very stringent emission regulations. Now the good part is they followed the road stuff and basically the road technology is going to kind of go into the off-road technology in that. So. Um, and then more of the work where I've been in, so I have a couple more slides on this. I apologize if you're really interested on the engine stuff. Um, some of the stuff we've been looking at is camless engines. Again, driven by new regs, cost. Okay, it's a funny thing because manufacturers really don't know where to go with it, but they can't ignore it because if you miss out, you got 40 million engines a year being made. You know, so you don't want to miss the bandwagon. Um, current cam, like we said, the profile is optimized for one operating point. In camless, we can vary lift, timing, dwell, cylinder deactivation, AGR, multiple fuels, part of the thing I'm looking at now at Purdue, engine braking. Okay, so it adds some cost to put it on there, but I think you add a lot of, or you take off a lot of things that are currently now added on to give you variable valve actuation, EGR, and stuff like that. Uh, most manufacturers now have VVA, variable valve actuation, or VVT, whatever you want to call it. Most very phase, some very profile. Now phase, I'm basically saying when your valves open and close inside your engine. Okay, some very profile, the actual shape of them. That's a little bit more difficult to do. Normally they switch between different cams or an oblong one. And some very lift. Okay, BMW is one of the first. And if you can very lift, now you can get rid of the throttle itself and go to quote a throttleless engine. Okay, so you can really reduce your pumping losses. Um, okay, so two categories for the motivation. If I can reduce the comp consumption of fuel and at the same time burn it cleaner, it's a win-win. Okay. Um, how do you get it? Valve overlap. Again, this is more of the technical stuff. I'm gonna, you know, if it's not interesting, um, we'll go through it quickly enough that hopefully you don't zone out by the time we get to the next slide. No. Cylinder deactivation. Have you heard you know, you know, the new Chrysler commercial? Well, uh, Daimler Benz. Okay. Um, cylinder deactivation. That's easy to do with uh, camless engines. So basically, the things that are on engines now that we keep adding more things to do. If we could ever find a way to do the camless thing, would take care of a lot of those. Okay, now is that the 100 year solution? No way. Okay, we'll talk about you know, how it fits into the whole scheme of things. Um, they're predicting the engine can get another 20% efficient. Okay, that's, and that's significant. Um, timing requirements, it's a difficult thing because the valve has to open and close at six milliseconds, open and close in six milliseconds, and it takes a lot of power to move things quickly. A camshaft is remarkably efficient, okay, because a lot of the energy gets back as the spring decompresses. Um, power consumption then is one of the big problems. Seating velocity, okay, even if it didn't damage the valves, how many people would buy a car if they heard tick, 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 okay, not too many, okay. Um, cost, size, packaging, and then a lot of the, uh, the um, models right now require sensors on every one, and if you look at the cost, the, the uh, percentage of cost in cars in the next five years is predicted, uh, the electronics portion is 30 to 40 percent of the cost of the car you buy will be in the electronics. So pretty phenomenal what's happening in the automotive industry, yeah. Um, it's already up at, I think, 20 percent or so. I mean, it's, it's not a small percentage of the cost of making a car. Um, okay, so the, the big question I think all the manufacturers have, and even me in terms of how much time and effort to spend, is will implementation be in time to matter? Now, if you talk to a fuel cell person, okay, at least two years ago, everyone would say, well, skip all that and let's go right to fuel cells. I think most people are realizing that fuel cells aren't going to happen in the next two years. Okay. Um, there might be people in here to debate that. That'd be fun afterwards. We'll see. Okay, um, but regardless of whether you go to fuel cells or not, have everyone heard of the wheel to well comparisons? And there's a lot of sources. I just picked one. What's more interesting to look at, and people don't realize it, with um, what we call zero emission vehicles. I mean, it's fairly logical if you think about it. But the energy doesn't come from the pie in the sky. I mean, you got to make it somewhere. Whether you make it at a power plant, whatever. Um, the interesting thing on here, this is a standard gasoline engine, E85 engine, um, uh, smaller gasoline. They did a, basically a study, it was done up in Canada, where they took all these and they tried to simulate all these cars with a 3,000, I think it was a 3,000 pound weight, same drag coefficient, same rolling coefficient, even though these cars wouldn't, and compared the emissions from the actual original source of the energy to the miles driven. Okay, and what do you see? Uh, this is a lithium uh, battery, small diesel, variable valve engines. 
And then these two are fuel cells, um, the standard gasoline hybrid electric, the older style, the new high, uh, 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 prior, no, prior, the Prius hybrid electric vehicle. Okay, this is the total energy consumption megajoules per, per kilometer. So how, many, how much energy does it take to drive a kilometer? Okay, well, there's not really a big advantage. And in fact, the fuel cells on here aren't even necessarily the best. Now this is getting close to it on there. But more interesting is how many emissions are made to drive per kilometer. Okay, and are fuel cells better? Yes, but the sources of energy right now that we need to make the hydrogen aren't, you know, okay, they need a lot of work yet too. So it's not like when we call zero emission vehicles, we're getting rid of zero emissions. We actually have significant emission problems even with fuel cells, okay? Um, right now with the exotic materials going in there and other things, you can make other arguments, but just from the standpoint of energy going in. Now E85, in terms of upstream greenhouse gases, actually gets negative because you're growing it okay, for those right in the biofuels. So it does have a plus, um, but not enough to make back for what you get on the other one. So basically just shifts it over to the left. So um, again, fuel cells are good, but they're not a whole lot better than what the Prius is right now in terms of uh, well-to-wheel analysis. Okay. Okay, so where should we be going? In other words, that's kind of our snapshot, okay? And it's certainly not meant to be depressing by any means, although in some ways it should be saying we've got to start looking ahead what we're going to be doing. Um, none of those developments are carbon neutral energy sources, okay? But carbon neutral, there's possibly fossil fuels that would still be carbon neutral depending how you do, okay, what we call CO2 sequestration, which is an interesting problem. But what does or can, okay? Global energy consumption right now is 13 terawatts. Okay, what I want to kind of do is give you a big picture again of the energy and what is available to us on Earth and how are we going to look at this. Projected to double by 2050, so by 2050 we'll have to find a way, current standard of living, 26 terawatts, and by 2100, 39 terawatts. Okay, that's a lot of zeros after the 26 and 39, by the way. Okay, um, so 4 times 10 to the 20th joules annually is what we consume right now in terms of the Earth. Okay, absolutely you know, amazing if you think about it. Um, okay, so let's look at what are some of our options. Okay, some we know about. Okay, what are the options? Fossil fuels plus carbon sequestration, nuclear power, and then you have your whole group of renewable, hydroelectric, geothermal, wind, solar, I'll actually group electricity, biofuels, biomass, and thermal. Okay, so in other words, biomass is, in terms of where it's not energy gain, has to come from the sun. Um, and then you got either photovoltaics or your thermal concentrators, whatever you, uh, device you want to do um, for heat or um, power. So let's look at some of those in a minute. Fossil fuels, what about coal? Okay, long term, uh, and this is in terms of Indiana and uh, Illinois and Kentucky, there's an $85 million program just put in place of which um, Indiana gets a third of that to uh, develop clean coal technologies. Okay, so in other words, the U.S. has made right now a commitment that we're going to use more coal, and hopefully find a cleaner way to do it. 25% of the world's reserves in the U.S., there's a lot of coal, 35 million tons mined per year. At the current rate, we have about 100 years of coal left. Okay, again, qualifying it at the current rate, but there is a lot of coal, okay? Um, and what some of the, the uh, researchers, we started a new energy center at Purdue, we're looking at coal gasification or liquefaction, literally for liquid fuels for motor vehicles. Um, it can also then be used to produce the hydrogen, okay? Um, okay, the problem is the, the way that they're proposing to do the clean coal is, is uh, carbon sequestration, and at the current rates, I forget the, we, we put in something like a 26 billion pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere right now, okay? If you take that and you need to try to sequest it somewhere down in the ground, basically put it in the ground and let it naturally uh, be taken care of, it's about the volume of Lake Superior every year. Okay, I don't think we're going to probably find an easy place to put all that in. Um, it's a challenge, but people, so maybe on a smaller scale, because otherwise you've got to do something with the CO2 or else we've got problems with that. Okay, what about nuclear? Okay, oops, problems, yeah, greenhouse gases, carbon, yeah, just that. Okay, if we want to get just 10 terawatts of our power that we predicted we need 26 terawatts by uh, 2050, we need one to build one new gigawatt uh, fission plant, finished every other day for the next 50 years, and then we deplete our uranium in 10 years. Okay, now, th this, uh, th these sources are from the uh, Department of Energy studies that go on. Okay, they're, they're, they may be somewhat biased, but they're probably not as biased as uh, anti-nuclear people, so I'm not sure where you want to paint your picture, but either way, it's an interesting uh, problem to look at. Um, when was the last uh, nuclear plant finished in the U.S.? 
relatively recent. There was one in 96, but when was that started? 1970. Okay, there has been no new power plants commissioned in the U.S. since 1970. Every other one after that, over 100, have been uh, canceled. Okay, so we have not, the U.S. in particular has not made a commitment to go to nuclear. Now, there's a little bit of renewed interest. France, on the other hand, gets something, I forget, 70, 80% of its power by nuclear. Okay, so they're uh, probably one of the, in terms of percentage, the highest country that's using it. Um, part of the problem right now is the cost to build um, is two to six billion dollars to build a nuclear power plant, and then you got the waste issue. Okay, so is that going to be our long term, maybe a short term buffer again? I don't think um, you know, you're going to look at that in terms of being a sustainable source of energy. Okay, so that leaves renewable energy, which might make more people happy here in the room because we have a lot of renewable energy activities going on. We have a lot of corn, we have a lot of uh, soybeans, and stuff like that. Um, Right now in the U.S., renewable fuels account for only 2% of the energy used. Okay, oil accounts for 30. Okay, we've got a long ways to go, or you can look at it as an optimist and say, wow, there's a lot of room for improvement. Depends how you want to look at it, okay? But renewable sources are growing at 20 to 30% a year. 25% of Sweden's comes from it, 45% of Norway's, a lot of that hydroelectric. Okay, so um, the, the U.S. has... Uh, their model shows a model of having available cheap oil for many years in, in terms of how we uh, have uh, placed ourselves. Um, okay, wind, what about wind? Uh, in 1980, not that long ago, it was 46 cents a kilowatt hour. It's now down to less than 6 cents a kilowatt, kilowatt hour. The problem is, is if you put wind turbines in every practical place, that's how they phrased it, okay, you'd get 2 to 4 terawatts of power. Okay, so wind isn't going to be the answer to everything that we do. Okay, now I think it's also, again, we're going to come down to the end, is what, which one do we want to pick? There's a lot of reasons to go with wind in a lot of places, though. Okay, geothermal, total available, if you took over the whole land area at 12 terawatts, of which you'd probably not get much of that at all, so that's not going to solve it. And then you look at hydroelectric, total practical remaining resources, um, 0.5 terawatts, if you took the cumulative energy of all the tides and ocean currents, that's another thing people are looking at, and you're able to harness it all, that's about two terawatts. Okay, Still only a fraction of what we need. Um, the uh, hydroelectric um, has another downside, depending on your view of the environment, in the sense that you also cause significant changes to your environment when you do it in there. It's not wind you do, too, in terms of birds and stuff, so you can make the case with almost any of them. So that leaves solar energy in its three forms. So electrical fuels, biomass, and thermal, okay? Um, right now, if you put a 10% efficient collector, okay, which we're above that, over 1.6% of the U.S. land area we, would supply all our domestic needs, the average amount of sunlight, okay? It's about the area covered by the federal highway system, okay, about 0.1% of land on Earth would supply 20 terawatts. Okay, more energy strikes the Earth in one hour than what's consumed in a year, Current solar electricity is one millionth of the total electricity used. Okay, um, so you got to ask yourself why. I'm not a solar energy person, and yet the numbers are very interesting to me to see the actual amount of energy that hits the Earth every day is absolutely phenomenal. Okay, if you harness all the other ones, we're not even close to what solar does. Okay, now there's a lot of problems because what is the cost ratio right now? It's 50 to 100 times more expensive to generate heat by solar. And it's five to ten times more expensive to generate electricity by solar. Okay, not to mention manufacturing-related environmental stuff. So there, there's issues there, but on the other hand, there's a awful lot of energy. And I think that if the sun goes down, that's going to be the least of our concerns that we no longer have that source of energy. Okay? <laughs> and pedal bikes with the old generators on there. So, um, so okay, so that is an interesting thing. So what's the future of biofuels in that? Um, U.S. produced 3.4 billion gallons in 2004, 21% increase. Um, oops, I did back, uh, back my numbers up. 2005, 21% up from 2004. Okay, apologize for that. Um, currently, it's used in 12% of all gasoline sold. In other words, 12% of the gasoline you buy would have that mixed in, but it's only 1% by volume. So it's a very, very small percentage yet. Indiana just started their new energy center and a whole program. They're trying to build a lot more plants. I was way ahead of us in terms of uh, ethanol plants. Um, we want to produce 20 million gallon, 200 million gallons by 2007, another 40 million in biodiesel. Okay, 10% of the fuels in the state by 2007, 
um, per, I'm sorry, not all fuels, 10% by all fuels by 2007, 20% um, B20 by 2025. Okay, a lot of companies already have E85 compatible models out and that list is growing. Okay, so in other words, are there opportunities for ethanol? Okay, and, and uh, soy diesel and even switchgrass stuff, yes. I've heard the claim made that it takes as much gasoline to produce a gallon. It takes a gallon of gas to produce a gallon of ethanol. Would you comment on that, please? Yeah, that's uh, it was in my notes, and I was hoping we'd skip over. No, um, uh, is your last name Pimentel by chance? Or? No, he's, no, he's a, there. There, he is, there happens to be one person who keeps publishing that out, and he's the guy that you know. You look at the top ten list in Yahoo that everyone reads. You know, their most viewed news stories, and he's the one they read. And uh, uh, you look at USDA on the other extreme, and they're saying it's sixty to eighty percent. Okay, so if you put in one watt, you know, or you know, one joule, you'll get one point eight joules out. Okay. Basically, what it comes down to is what are you willing to account as input and output? If you are basically account for all the extra stuff that's left over from the ethanol that you can feed it to cattle and you put, you know, or swine or whatever, you put value to it, then you can show positives. And if you're unwilling to take in that account, then you're, you're going to have a hard time showing a balance. Okay. So, um, I think that I, I, my, my view is, and read, I read quite a bit, I've seen summary tables of eight different sources. I will say six out of the eight sources normally would say it's positive, but the positives range from 5% to that, that 60 or 70%. Um, it, it's an interesting thing. It, 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 uh, I'll, well, let me get, I think the next slide uh, shows that more. But yeah, it's, the, um, there, I would say there's generally a net positive. Now, if the rules change right now in Indiana, they let us change, uh, feed it wet. Okay, some of the residues, which makes it a lot cheaper if you have to dry it and do other things, and that's another energy input that you got to put in that account for in the fuel. Um, so it's, it, it depends both on the application. Now, we used to only get, oh, now I can't, now I can't remember the numbers, one point something gallons out of a, a barrel, or a bushel, I'm sorry, now we're over just under two gallons. So the efficiency of getting it out has also increased a lot. So it depends what study you want to use for that and what numbers. Um, yeah, there, there I, would, I would say I would... Confirm that there's a net increase. How much? I'm not real sure. Yeah. What um, about the, the government subsidies for ethanol? They, supposedly the studies took those out, but because if you, yeah, otherwise that's not fair. If you look at that in terms of a cost thing, but they, what remember the studies is an energy in, energy out. So, in terms of making a profit, the government subsidy affects that. In terms of the energy ratio, that doesn't really affect that. Um, I, I do know that at least the last study, um, I'm not in that area. I work with people in the energy center that are thoroughly involved in that um, same kind of same kind of program you guys have here, is that most farmers, if they um, went to ethanol or um, fuels for that and had a plant, a co-op or something like that, it would be profitable. And that was before the current spike. It would really be profitable right now. So can you make money with it? You know, yeah, I think you'd be closer to break even if the subsidies went away, but that's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd rather have them subsidize that than Hummers. <laughs> so, okay. So I've been ignoring the last, uh, oops, oh, let me get one more slide here. Um, biofuels, so you got electricity, heat, comparable cost of fossil, less reliance on imported energy. Um, Disadvantages, okay, and hopefully the number's not too depressing. If you use switchgrasses, which most people compare with, okay, the officer's work done, uh, I think, in Illinois is miscanthius. Um, all the arable land, anything that would lend itself to being able to grow, it would only produce 13 terawatts, and that wouldn't leave anything left for food, okay? So it's not the only, and I don't think most people working in there say that it is. Um, energy yield is dependent on many factors, so you get weather issues and stuff like that. Um, for every 10% uh, of fuels being bio-based, you only actually end up saving 5% of the fo uh, fossil fuels on average because of the work input that's got to go in. So, you know, you're not gaining, if you go to 10% ethanol, you're using, you're really only gaining 5% savings in your oil usage. Um, what a lot of the experts, we call them experts, at least the people at Purdue that are looking at it and selling it more to the government, is right now our refineries are operating at about 97% capacity. If we're able to basically bump that down to 92, 91% capacity just by having ethanol as a buffer, our, our oil pricing supply would be much stabilized and prices would be better. Okay, not to mention, you know, Indiana, to be, to be honest, is also looking at it as an economic, you know, it's a huge thing. You got land sitting there, you got farmers, you got equipment. 
okay, um, job creation with the ethanol plants. You know, it's kind of a win-win. Even if you don't make a lot of money, you're putting money into your economy. It's locally grown, locally produced. So, that, you know, in terms of an argument that I would say realistically is one that certainly Indiana, by investing in all this, is looking at. You know, like I said, I was been ahead of us in terms of numbers. Um, so, okay, last thing. Everyone's asking what about hydrogen now, right? Okay, we talked about all the options, disadvantages. Everyone's like, oh, we're going to go to a hydrogen economy, not oxygen, like I said earlier. I wish I could re-record that now and get that off, but no. Okay, two most common elements in the universe are hydrogen and stupidity. I have no idea who he said it, but I like him already. Okay, you hear that a lot because everyone says, hydrogen's everywhere. Let's use it. Well, it's pretty intimate with everything that it's with right now. It's not just hanging out there. Okay. Um, 1874. Jules Verne, I believe that one day hydrogen and oxygen, which together form water, will be used either alone or together as an inexhaustible source of heat and light. Call him a visionary or what, but it's kind of interesting that it was in 1874 he said that. Okay, so, well, kidding aside, what must be done to achieve a hydrogen economy? Okay, advancements in fuel cells, cost, operating ranges, efficiencies, development of a hydrogen infrastructure, source of hydrogen, storage of hydrogen, um, even liquid hydrogen, which takes even additional energy in the conversion process to, to uh, uh, get it back into a liquid, is only one-fourth the energy density of gasoline. So to get the same range, assuming everything else being equal, you need four times as large a gas tank and fuel source on board. Okay, if you don't take the time to compress it back down to a gas, then you got other bigger problems. Okay, um, so what about the advancements in fuel cells cost, operating ranges, can we fix some of those? I, I think engineers will find ways to do some of that. Development of hydrogen infrastructure, you know, in reality that's a financial issue. If you take all the money we spent on the war and everything else, we'd probably have one. I'm not saying a statement about that at all, but I'm just saying, you know, in terms of money, the money, we, you know, we can come up with that if we have to. Um, storage of hydrogen, okay, we can probably do that. What most people don't realize, okay, and I won't say engineers or insult or anyone in the room, but when I talk to people on the street, everyone's like, well, why aren't you looking at fuel cells? I mean, that's what I hear. They say, where we work on efficient systems. Well, where are you going to get the hydrogen from? Okay, the reason I put all those last slides in there and looked at energy in terms of global use in the world is right now, to get hydrogen, you need energy. Okay, hydrogen's attached to everything. We're getting energy when we let it reattach back to the oxygen um, and uh, release one of those electrons. But... Any time, just fundamental laws of physics, you convert energy from one form to another, you put more energy in than you get out, okay? I was eight years old, wanted to be an engineer, and I developed a, a perpetual motion machine. I told my dad I was going to get a battery, I was going to get you know, a uh, motor, I was going to put a light bulb in the middle, I was going to let it run and make light. And it shattered my dreams. I thought I was rich, okay? No, we haven't developed a perpetual motion machine yet. I don't think we will, according to all the physics that I've had and still you know, teach. But, okay, so you got the source of hydrogen issue. Okay, where are you going to get it from? Then you go back to the renewable fuels. If you're talking about long-term sustainability, whether it's hydrogen or not, it's not so much hydrogen or fuel cells or cars or anything else. It's a source of energy to get the fuel to drive them. Energy or hydrogen is just an energy storage. It's, it's like it's, you're making basically homemade gasoline. Okay, it's a place to store energy, put it in a car and burn it without any emissions on the car itself. Okay, so, you know, what do we do? Do we do steam reformers? Okay, if you use natural gas or methane, then you get carbon monoxide out. Do you gasification for fuel and coal? If you do electrolysis, you need electricity. Where's that going to come from? Okay, there's work done in organic methods, chemical methods. Somewhere there should be a breakthrough. Okay, I'm certainly not a pessimist with that. It's just it's a bigger problem than what we had. Um, in fact, it was just in today quick, I saw, I don't know, if, I think it was on Yahoo, um, there's a thing on Life Car. whenever I see an energy thing I read it, but um, basically there's a, uh, they're developing a little uh, fuel cell driven program, you know, they're putting 3.3 million dollars into it in Britain, a consortium of companies to come up with a fuel cell. Okay, now just to show you, this, these are all these experts in the field from the company, and um, Hugh Spowers, I have no idea who he is, from one of the companies in the group, this is what he says in the article, quoted. This project is the first fruit of a great deal of work on the whole system of fuel cell powered vehicles. We hope to be able to demonstrate that the perceived barriers to the adaption of hydrogen fueled vehicles, i.e. the high cost of fuel cells and hydrogen storage, are, if not bogus, much less of a problem than is conventionally thought. The whole article I read didn't talk once about where we're going to get the hydrogen from. 
I agree with them. We can store, we can solve the storage problems and the fuel cell. I mean, we'll keep working on that. We got nanotechnology. We got a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline that we need to turn to it. But if we don't solve the energy problem, we haven't solved a whole lot. Okay, in my view. Um, so, I, I guess in the conclusion, I have no idea what time it is, or if you're completely bored by now. But let's draw a conclusion, anyways. Okay. I firmly believe. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I don't disagree with that. I guess I question the transportation cost of getting it here. Okay, I, I yeah, I, I haven't considered that a whole lot. I, you know, we've made big advancements in uh, getting Spaceship One up and down for the Ansari Prize, but I don't think we're to the point we can get hydrogen. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't think it's so much. There's hydrogen everywhere. Is it going to take more energy to go get it out there? You still have to capture it somehow and do it, or or to find a way to make it here. I don't know. We got a lot of sun hitting us. I mean, that was an amazing stat to me. That, I don't know, yeah. Um, okay, so I, you know, it's a great time to be an engineer or scientist. If you're not one in the room, don't feel slighted. Okay, I'm very narrow-minded, stereotypical engineer, according to my wife. Okay, so solutions. I really believe, and this is a buzzword at Purdue. It's a buzzword everywhere. They need to be multidisciplinary. Okay, it was fun tonight. The group of students on the where they're at. I asked them what are their majors, and it was chemical and mechanical and electrical, and I'm going to get them all wrong and. Whatever. Okay, but that's what those are the groups we're going to have to form and work together. Um, it's the systems. Okay, we're down at the levels like even things on nanotechnologies that it's not just one thing anymore because you get the interaction between all these different disciplines. Um, should we throw out all the short-term solutions? Should we keep looking at wind or anything else? Okay, again, I started off talking about transportation. Hopefully, I convinced you that the transportation current mode, I want to say, is a band-aid, but it's a short-term solution. Okay, do we need to work on hybrid vehicles? It's a no-brainer. We need to extend our resources as far as we can. Um, but what about, you know, long-term? Is, you know, is transportation sustainable? Not without a lot of work and down the road. I mean, after looking at all the numbers and doing stuff and looking at this for a while, we're not even close. We're not on a path towards it. Okay, there's a lot of challenges for engineers out there. Um, Improvement in and utilization of every option is really, you know, I think we've got to take the win the ones that are available and economically um, feasible right now, we have to start taking and developing. When those run out, hopefully we've got something else developed in the next. Keep working on fuel cells, okay? Um, will hydrogen be the energy storage medium of the future? There's certainly a lot of money going into that and uh, political clout to say that it is, okay? Um, so it's an interesting... Uh, question. Um, be a steward, okay. For whatever reason you came here tonight, um, I mean, I, I see we weren't put on the earth to use all the resources in two or three generations, I mean, which is basically what we're doing right about now. I mean, we are using it at an alarming rate when you look at it from even 1650 on up, okay. And um, I really think that we were be, you know, put on here to take care of the earth that we were given, and, and if we don't change how we're doing it, we're not going to have something we're real proud of to give to our kids. And not, not even to scare you. I, I think every time that we're faced as a challenge in humanity, we're provided means, and fortunately, we all are given gifts that we can solve something, and I think that's what it'll be. So it's an exciting time. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for surviving with me. If you have any uh, questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Would you comment on, on, on Iceland going through a hydrogen economy? Uh, I don't know that much about it, so I don't, yeah. I know Alaska. They have. They have. Yeah. yeah, okay. They're using wind and geothermal to produce hydrogen. Mm -hmm. their, their public transportation now is for buses that run off a hydrogen fuel cell. I did hear that. I didn't know where they were getting it all, yeah. And they're selling their excess hydrogen to uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the, the wind in Iowa will produce about five times the energy that we use for electricity in Iowa. If you took advantage of all of it. If we took advantage yeah, of all of that's, it. Yeah. What would be the problem with, with using that wind to associate water to Oh, no, it comes down to the same thing. There is a, the available wind power around the world isn't enough to solve our energy problems in 2050. Okay, that, I'm not saying not to do it now. I think exactly right. Now, you'll ask why Iceland work and hearing the story. What's their resource to use rate? Okay, you probably couldn't put that model in place everywhere and generate enough wind 
and geothermal energy to provide enough hydrogen, say, for Chicago. Okay, in other words, their population density is pretty small. It's a great model. I'm glad to hear they're doing it. In fact, I, you know, I love it. I did hear about the buses. I didn't realize they were completely that. But that's not a model that is going to produce enough power around the world. Should we continue that model and exploit it wherever we can? Certainly. I'm all for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a yeah. What kind of role do you think um, plan development for public uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Oh, sorry. Um, what role do you think uh, plan development and public transportation play in creating a sustainable transportation system? If we didn't live in America, I'd say we have a higher chance of that. I don't see, unless it's absolutely necessary, we're going to change. Um, has bus ridership gone up significantly? With the high fuel prices, yeah, it, it's gone up. But I guess I'm asking significantly. I mean, if people severely change their habits, they're taking away things like vacations and ice cream. <laughs> okay. Now, I I hope they do. After being in Europe, now, and granted, the U.S. is different. Public transportation in Iowa is not an easy thing, right? It might be easy in Ames, it might be easy in Des Moines, but it's not an easy thing around the state. Um, but Europe is much closer together. You know, it was great. You know, we didn't need a car the whole time we were over there to go around. I don't see the U.S., you know, at, at least not at this point, getting there. I, I'm all in favor of it. You know, I use it when I can, but we don't actually have much in Lafayette unless you're on campus. All the literature out there right now speaks a lot about the efficiency of hybrid cars and the kind of cars. What about the maintenance? Um, I don't think the maintenance has to be higher. Okay, I, I think the uh, issue is who wants to spend three thousand dollars after eight years to put a new battery in it. I mean, right now that's the prediction. Okay, the new batteries, they are trying to get to be the number of cycles that the car would last. I forget what it is, it's fifteen years and one hundred eighty thousand miles or something like that. Um, Maintenance is a little higher. I think when I saw Toyota's numbers come back, the initial quality was as good as any other car. Now it's been slightly higher to maintain, but still actually very, very respectable. So I, I think that problem can be solved. In other words, it's not exotic technology on the car. There's no reason that the motors and the planetary gear sets, you know, it's not fancy stuff going on in the car in terms of reliability. Is it more complex? Yes. But our whole car is more complex than it was 20 years ago, and would you say it's more reliable? Yeah. It, it, without a subsidy, my understanding is it's, it takes you most of the life of the car to get back the value. Now, that was before the fuel prices went up. Obviously, fuel prices go up 30%. Your return on investment goes down just as quickly, too. Shortens. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll, I'll come back and remind me uh, here. Uh, I understand that some people are trying to develop uh, um, hydrogen that you can generate while on your car. Mm hmm Um, that was in the category of the uh, methane or uh, even uh, some of the, I think, ethanol-based reformers, onboard reformers. Um, they still have uh, CO2 emissions usually to make it or to, or to get the um, uh, fuel there. So there, there's actually work also going on in pellets and chemical reactions to produce the hydrogen. So I think they take aluminum pellets. I forget there's a lot of different materials they're looking at, and then you basically put pellets in in a reaction. Um, in, in all cases, it's difficult if you look at the whole energy chain from beginning to end. Um, to, to, if you don't have a renewable source of energy making any of those fuels, it's not ultimately, you know, a renewable source. So. The, the you know the the, the energy predictions. Um, I would say they're trends. I don't know, and I would only trust them so far as they're trends. Okay. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, I guess I'd have to read read the fine lines more on there. Yeah, it's it's a very good question. I, I guess I look at it. I mean, to, to answer that, how easy is it to build homes that are more efficient? How much more costly? Not much at all. How much energy can you save? I'll bet fifty percent. Okay. What we haven't done even yet is taken care of the easy fixes. And you're right. We can extend our energy 
um, reserves much longer than we currently are on pace to with, I would say, easy fixes. In, in a lot of cases, it's lack of education. Okay, I had to educate myself, but then the builders didn't want to listen to me. said, oh, that, that won't work. Okay, or you can't do this. Okay, and then once I show them everything, well, oh, that's pretty cool. And I got some people calling me and say, oh, what'd you do there and this and that. And, um, you know, and, and uh, it, it's education a lot. It's codes. I mean, if you build to minimum codes, at least in Indiana, um, you would waste a tremendous amount of energy. You know, so I, I, you know, I look at that and same thing cars. Why, why work on hybrid vehicles right now if we're still going to run on energy? Well, it's going to extend it. The technology's there. It's a no-brainer to me. You know, develop the wind that we have. It's going to take all the – if you add all the pieces together right now, we actually have a pretty good picture for at least 100 years. But if we don't make changes, who knows? Yeah. Uh, what did you say, dark matter? Yeah. I will plead ignorance. Okay, sounds like a black hole, which I have no idea. You know, no, I don't. You know, if you want to explain your idea more, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about, to be honest. I'm tend to grow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to clarify or else I'll move on. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to you more afterwards. That that was a new one to me. So I haven't done a lot in space. Okay. Someone asked me something I know now. <laughs> uh, well it is a hybrid. How does it compare to batteries? Yes. It, it all is a function of, of rate of charge and discharge. If you charge a battery very slowly, it's not bad because obviously your resistive losses are very low. Um, the accumulator, your efficiency doesn't change as a function of time. Now, it, I will qualify that it used to because you heat up the gas quickly, you, you get um, heating of the gas due to the compression, the heat would escape off into the atmosphere. Some of the early work, this was done back in the 80s, they put closed cell foam in the accumulators and uh, the foam basically compared to the weight of the inert gases there is an infinite heat sink and they could basically compress it and decompress it as much as they want and it was isothermal process, no heating. And they were getting 98% efficiency with a, basically dump out the fluid and pump it back in as fast as you can. So um, yeah, it's, it's a different, you're enter, you know, you'd be lucky to get a vehicle up to 30 miles an hour and your accumulator is empty. That's the type of energy density, it's very low that way. Well, remember, your air goes up with V squared, velocity squared, so it really depends on driving. You know, and the opposite side is the, the slower you go, the tend to more stop and start you go, so then your braking losses are, are a higher percentage. Um, going down the road, you know, it varies so much. Um, aerodynamic drag, 15, 18 horsepower on a modern car, it's hard to tell. Um, some are a little lower. Um, but you got a high accessory loads on today's cars. You know, that's actually a big problem is the accessory load that we're putting on engines, electric. I mean, it's hard to, to wrap a belt enough around the alternator nowadays to keep it from uh, not squealing. So in terms of your big picture, uh, if we did everything right, we could probably hit 80 miles per gallon on average. Okay, I think after that point, you, you have to start driving cars that look like uh, airfoils or something. Um, uh, once I, let me get, get over here and then I'll come back. Okay. Uh, there was a recent headline about a German scientist that was using uh, disposed material to create a, an engine. You, using disposed, you mean like a biomass disposal? Well, he said he could use any kind of garbage. Yeah, there, there is work going on uh, multiple places on Stirling engines, external combustion engines, 
that uh, can be pretty efficient, um, which they need any source of heat, so biomass is a prime candidate for something like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's the case, but that, that would be a similar application that I am familiar with, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, if, yeah, if people need to start going or I'll you know stick around and answer as long as you have questions. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 66 under eight condition. And, in fact, the more you stop and start and the slower that you do it, the more the, the hybrids actually get better mileage in town than they do out in, on highway driving. You, you got, your, your aerodynamic and your rolling losses are not recoverable going down the highway. That's the percentage of your load. That's the, the largest percentage of your, your energy input into the car. When you're in town, most of your energy is acceleration, deceleration, and those are recoverable and they're put back into the acceleration of the car. So it depends really dependent on driving. All right, let's draw this to a close. Um, people have further questions for Mr. Lumpkins. They can address them in person. I thank you for coming tonight.